All right, folks, this is Rabble Rousing Rich Bergeron. And we also have, we also have uh, guest host Tyson. He probably won't talk much, but he's hanging out here with us. Tyson and Cat. Not Mike Tyson. Uh, the real Mike Tyson had a very good podcast with our former guest, uh, recent guest, uh, Ken Shamrock, uh, just recently. And uh, better get my ass on that dubbing of the tape because uh, his event's coming up real soon, 20, 20-something 20 is September here. But, uh, yeah, Mike Tyson uh, and Ken Shamrock got together, and I'm surprised they haven't really had conversations before, but he, I guess he just first met him. I follow somebody on Facebook who's like one of uh, Ken Shamrock's people, I guess. And, he, uh, yeah, he was very humbled by the whole experience. He really enjoyed talking to Mike, and he was baffled by the idea that this guy is, like, so kind. <laughs> yeah, they probably didn't get to speak much. Mike Tyson was probably way more famous then. <laughs> but he's less famous now. different um, sports um, related, to, related mostly to Philadelphia, um, which, you know, includes members of the Phillies because they're not playing, um, you know, tomorrow night. They're playing um, Saturday and Sunday against the richest team, the Red Sox. Um, so they're off tomorrow, so they got members of the Phillies that are going to be there Saturday, and they got some guys from the Flyers and some old-school uh, Eagles players. Lawrence Taylor's going to be there, which I really don't understand why it is a Philadelphia event. But Mike Tyson and Evander Holyfield are both going to be there. And um, they said, like, the way it is. And actually, Rich, from what you said in the past, it's actually more of a bargain than anything because um, for a individual photo of Mike Tyson, I, I don't know what the signing is, but for a photo op with them, it's 100 bucks. For Holyfield, the photo, the photo op's 100 bucks. And then for both of them together at the same time, it is, um, um, I think, I think it's 300. Yeah. You could obviously tell which which of the Alvarez brothers uh, had the good box and jeans. Well, now, now what do you guys think about that? Missing, missing the weight that bad and the idiotic excuse. Can you believe that excuse? That the scales yeah, weren't calibrated? Unbelievable. Yeah, that is pretty I mean, bad. It was, and it was I mean, pretty, I didn't see the point live. I saw the replay, so I didn't. I didn't even hear the whole thing. I just well, it, it, yeah, it, it was it was a travesty. He was, God, I don't know, what about ten pounds over the eight pounds over 
the limit within a day or so, and supposedly he starved himself. But, I mean, I'm thinking, a professional fighter, you go to any gym, I mean, come on, get on their scales. Yeah, really. And, and how do you, how do you, I mean, I've heard of this judging. I mean, and I know cutting weight's not simple. But damn it, when you're at that level, you haven't figured it out by now? Wow. <laughs> Definitely a fighter on the back nine. Yeah. I was talking about flying out the Vegas for that fight. Um, it didn't materialize. Because um, when I was in A, I had um, out was um you know we we flew out on Friday, um um went to the fight on Saturday, so around on Sunday flew home on Monday. Well I had already taken tomorrow off uh from work. That was already that was planned months ago. Uh, just do a long weekend. And then all my friends are gonna be out of town. I'm like, why well, I have nothing to do now. What am I gonna get into? What kind of bullshit am I gonna get into? And I'm like, you know, maybe I have to go out to the fight. And I'm, but I started looking at it. And I was like, I said, the money, you know, would have been expensive, but I could have argued that. I couldn't argue with myself was the travel time. Because if I was, I hadn't taken Monday off. So it would have been basically fly, go to tomorrow for check in, sit, sit there for two hours, jump on a plane for over five, get in, putz it for golf tomorrow night, which I'm fine with. I putz around very well. And, and I can do beverages very well. So, um, go to the fight, putz around in the morning, go to the fight, and then fly, and then, then be like Sam once. With the, the two uh, five hour flights, the four hours sitting in the um, um, airports, and then plus the hour each way traveling for a 50 trip. I couldn't just. Yeah, you got the odds on that. Um, um, yeah, uh, plus, um, plus uh, no, excuse me, yeah, um, 2,500. <laughs> so you put up 2,500 to win 100, and yeah. um, Wallen is plus 1,100. So if you want to take a fling on him, you put up a hundred to uh, win eleven hundred if you think you can pull it off. So, well, I remember the last time a guy named Tyson was such a big favorite. Yeah, uh, even bigger, forty-two to one. Yeah, you have to put up four thousand two hundred dollars to win a hundred. I didn't think there was much action on that. But boy, can you imagine? Woo! Yeah, I, I, I put up like a mortgage payment. I got me a hundred bucks. <laughs> yeah.
Yep. But, um, I had 400 last week. Um, I'm in the one pool that I run, and if the stupid, and which I know this is going to upset you because he was a former New England assistant, that idiot Matt Patricia didn't blow an 18-point Detroit lead in the fourth quarter, go to overtime, and then not win, um, I would have had a clearer path because I had a bunch of people that had Arizona. I would have been ahead of them, but no, we were tied, and then I lost um, on the Oakland game Monday night. So that was 240 I didn't win. Same thing happened to me at the pool at work. That was another 120. And then I missed high score fantasy league by 15 points. So I had a chance at 400 and some. I walked out, as we say in Italian, Ugats. Well, my fantasy team is one and that was one. Let me see what that.
Who bad is it the guy that's favored has only won basically uh, less than 12% of his fights? Yeah. Hey, but, fight. but, but you know, they should, they should definitely be happy. Someone is keeping tabs on them. That's good. Yeah. So someone cares enough about them to record their record. Good for them. Wow. And no, and no draws, by the way. No draws. They win these 30 losses. He's actually a good fighter. Yeah, he's a pretty good fighter. Well, so it could be... And I do not. Like I said, it could be just like when he fought uh, when, when Tyson Fury fought Tom Schwartz back in June. You know, you had a guy who was twenty four and zero. Um, you know, you knew nothing about him, and you could see when he got in the ring that he was just, I mean, eight hundred miles out of his, um, you know, class. So yeah, he had an undefeated record, but he definitely did not have. Um, he, he wasn't tested, and that, that undefeated record was not. You know, against maybe the top tier opposition, because when he took that pass, he was outclassed. Yeah. Remember when we interviewed him, and like the first thing he said, how, I thought he said, How old are you?
Okay. Yep, only 35 minutes for me. Yeah, it, it, um, the, the only, the, the talk now is Tony Ferguson. The, can, he, can, he, can he not be beat by going up against the fence and trying to stop the takeout? That doesn't work. He's got to be pressured. He's got to be pressured, and it's easier said than done. If not Tony Ferguson, uh, let me ask you, Rich, what about that, uh, uh, what about Justin Gaethje, if he's able to get past Cowboy? You think the style that could make it interesting with Kareem? What do you think? Well, then, then, then there was only one other name that comes to mind. Um, that uh, really good wrestler um, Gillespie, I think it was uh, Gilbert Gillespie, I believe. Now he's been in, a bit inactive, but so far he he seems to have no holes in his game that I can see. Um, I could, otherwise, I mean, if, if, if Ferguson doesn't do it, I, I just don't. Khabib seems to be just a whole other level. If you 
seen Dustin's um, critique of the fight, like he just said, the guy wasn't the strongest guy he ever fought, but he just has the balance, the timing. I mean, he was just a machine. And even though Dustin hurt him a bit in the second one, did, 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 did you see the fight? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, Dustin... Du- Dustin may have blew his water bed. Um, you know, I, and I don't know if he was he was concerned about cardio, but I mean, this is you got to go for it. And he did have could be a bit hurt, but he just seemed to be a bit reluctant to really commit fully, and uh, just strategy didn't work. And, and he admitted that afterwards. I don't think I'd ever seen a fighter that devastated emotionally. He was crushed. I mean, my heart just ached for him. He was all, just broke down, and, and he was just an emotional message at that post fight press conference. Yeah, I, I, yeah. Well, if, if you're not in this, yeah, but, but the point is, like he was saying, if you're not in this to be the champ, where are you going? Because there's always that possibility, when you, especially when you crack the top ten. You've got to start thinking, okay, I'm in the top ten now. How many guys get here? And right now, he knows he won't be champ. And he's getting all these pep talks, but uh, it's got to be devastating. And he's blaming himself for this whole thing, too. I mean, it may not have made a difference, but I can just look back and see if he had that window of opportunity, he just wasn't able to step on the gas. And maybe he was just worried if he just got into a big uh, a, a punch, you know, just really started punching with everything he had, he'd, he'd blow his wad and that would be it, or else he'd be taken down, but then what's the strategy? You can't just stand there and let Freddie get his senses back. And I think uh, that, that'll haunt him. But to, yeah, that, that was was uh, one judge had Felder up 30 to 27. This just goes on and on. I guess I, I just don't even want to get upset about that kind of stuff anymore. Not doing my blood pressure any good. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, yeah, you could possibly make a case for 29-28. I mean, uh, uh, Felder won the third round. For sure. Uh, second round, I think Barbosa did a little more damage, uh, but you could, you know, if you're going to be generous, it wouldn't be a wrong robbery. But 30 to 27, hello? 30 to 20, I mean, the first round, Felder, Felder's a tough guy, but I, I, I just don't think he's going <laughs> to, you know, I mean, this was kind of, uh, I, I won't say a, a huge robbery, but, you know, 30 to 27 was just wrong. But uh, there just doesn't seem to be any fixing this, this, this incompetent judging. There's, how, how many years have we been talking about this? Since we got stuff. Remember, when I, first joined, when, I first, you know, when I first came on the show, the big fight back then was the first uh, Bradley versus Pacquiao. Oh, yeah. That's right. Yeah. And we were talking about, yeah, and we were talking about it then. Yeah. And, and, and then uh, Harry Reid comes I'm like he's going to do something. I mean, there's apparently just no fixing this. It, it, it's
<laughs> I don't know. Maybe we should just go um, until someone can't go. But I know there's problems with commercial problems with time frames on, on the pay-per-views. But I, that's the only answer. What other what other answer is there to stop this? To see this incompetence, this corruption, I don't know what you want to call it. Uh, it it's, uh, and, and probably uh, you can find the fight on YouTube. Just watch that first round if you get a chance. You don't need to watch the other two. Watch that first round. <laughs> well, you know, I, I the old-fashioned way. You can once you've watched enough, you know who's you know. And I'm, I mean, sometimes it's really close, but a lot of times in fights, it's not that challenging. Just look. And again, maybe there's no incentive to change things now because we keep falling for the same thing every week. As fight fans, we just we, you know we get mad and it's like twelve step program, you know, and then we're gonna we're, we're gonna just forget about all this, and then next week comes and we're right back falling for the same thing. So maybe you know maybe the state athletic commission say you know F the fans, who cares? Idiots have to come and watch, so we'll keep the corruption up and the incompetence, and uh, so what? I mean, it destroys. Fighters' lives, but who cares? They're just fighters. Sickening. Well, I know. Yeah. Well, you know, yeah, they can somehow uh, be a big factor, too, but um, no sense getting on that topic.
Yes. Yeah, that that was wild. So you think that uh, a cowboy, 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 cowboy will be the gatekeeper? Because I guess that's what he's turned into now. Because I don't think he'll get any more title shots. So he will be uh, and, a, and a very effective gatekeeper. My heart's kind of with Gaethy in that, but uh, it's hard to argue against Cowboy because he's he's doing it back now. You know, he's up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up. That's magic to be a fan of his like that. But I would agree. I think he'll be the gatekeeper on this one. Styles. Then again, then again, there's always a possibility. There's always a possibility Cowboys are going to get old overnight. That can happen. You know, you look at the long careers he's had. I mean, you just check that record out. I mean, who hasn't he fought? He's been in some wars, and maybe that maybe it'll be his time to just. You know, we've seen it happen. All of a sudden, the guy's old. <laughs> Does not kind of you know. I mean, back with the, un- the detachable thumbs that could happen. Like Mickey Walker was the uh, the master of the thumb.
I cranked his face. <laughs> I sort of net net crank, face crank. That's uh, you know, it's a little different. Sounds like a cool wrestling move. You know, you, you you wonder how those guys train together, um, even under the same roof. I, I never experienced anything like that. I mean, we're not creating a strong style. We're we're a team, and that's just it, it's just I, I don't know. I don't have words to describe that. I mean, you're, you're the training your training partners get. You all right, Tony, what about the gyms you've been in? Did you ever see anything like that where the two guys really went at it like that, that bad? You know, I mean, I've seen situations happen in the gym. I mean, I've seen sparring sessions get a little out of control. Um, you know, I've I've seen sometimes one go outside of, the, outside of the ring, which is rare, um, but it's happened. You know, I mean, there I, I had... I mean, I had some real um, unfriendly feelings with guys that I've been in the gym with. You know, I mean, sometimes you had to actually, and once again, from personal experience, uh, one guy and I had such a bad feeling with each other um, that they actually were um, separating our training times. And if there was a certain time that one of us would be at that gym, they might take the other one to a different gym. I mean, of course, that that is Philadelphia. Now we got to get the disclaimer. <laughs> we got Philly, Philly gym wars. Okay, that yeah, yeah, that's uh, well. One of the best compliments that I, actually I'm going to link them together. Two of the best compliments that I ever got. Uh, one was. In 19, actually, uh, what was 96 and what was 97? In 1996, which was my first fight back after knee surgery, and unfortunately, this fight convinced me that I was back further than I was, and I probably should have sat out even longer in rehab, uh, but I pummeled this guy so bad, I felt like, oh, I'm back, I'm 100%. Um, if I was, I would have knocked him out, because I couldn't push off my back foot. 
Um, but the guy that I fought in Naval Academy, um, I forget what his name was, um, but he went to my dad after the fight, and he goes, I've always heard the reputation of a Philadelphia fighter and how bad they really are. And he goes, and tonight I found out firsthand how true that is. So that, to me, first of all, it was a, a compliment that, for the city that I uh, represent, Philadelphia, that we are really known, um, you know, our reputation precedes, our, uh, precedes itself. Um, and that, and then also that I, me, was being considered a Philadelphia fighter to an outsider. And that was, you know, like an unbelievable compliment to me. Oh, yeah. Uh, a, year later, a, a year later, I'm in my Philly gym and I was, there was a couple guys that I was training with. Um, one guy was named Byron Jones. We call him Bam Bam. My dad will tell you this story all the time. Another guy was named Barry. Um, Bam Bam was a cruiserweight slash heavyweight. Barry was a super metal light heavyweight. So uh, one guy was slightly bigger than me. One guy was slightly smaller than me. Bam Bam was thickly, he was short and thickly built like me. You know, so he, we were like mirror images. And, you know, he was, he was more experienced than I was. He was a little bit older. So I would say he was maybe in his mid twenties at the time I was about 20. We would get in there and we would start tearing into each other. I mean, and it was just phone booth. And my dad always joked that we would both be going back to the corner after the uh, session, complaining about the other guy and how hard he hits and how strong he is. And we were both, we were like, they're both whining about the other one. Um, and then this other guy, Barry, who was also a, uh, he was a taller, lankier kid, a little, um, lighter, but he had long arms and he had, you know, it's a right hand that, you know, could knock over a building. And I remember he hit me with a couple of straight right hands. And then I would work in fighting in close. And I did the old Marciano trick on him, which was batter his arms, batter his torso, his shoulders and all that. And with both of these guys, the gym in Philadelphia would stop to watch us. And to me, that is the compliment upon compliments. Yes, sir, bud. That makes sense. Remember, Philadelphia, it's toughness, and it's all those old-school tricks. Yeah. All, all this, it's both. It's really both. Think about that. You know, and, and, and Tom, you, and you're... 100% right, because I'll tell you some of the things that I learned being in the gym. You know, I, I learned, you know, the one trainer that I worked with, um, he was one of the cornermen for Matthew Saad Muhammad. And he would tell the stories, like, he tells about the second Yacht fight. He goes, when that, I think it was the eighth round, that he goes, Saad was out. He was out on his feet. And we sat him down, and we were dousing him with water. And, you know, I think this fight's going to get stopped. And he goes, in that 60 seconds, he went from his eyes glazed, He's over and being out of it to shaking his head. And it was like, he, he blinked his eyes a couple of times and it's, I'm, I'm here. I'm awake. I'm good. I'm fine. You know, it was like, yeah, I mean, the group of Yeah, exactly. I remember that. And I think the fight was, it had to be, if you're Lopez, think about, it. think about what you're thinking about. Okay. It's like, damn, damn. I mean, that was everything. It was, uh, wow. Never Forget I mean, that. Everything, the kitchen sink, the back patio, um, you know, a couple cinder blocks. Um, I'll tell you, um, a couple other things I learned just from being in there. You know, they, they would teach, like, little tricks, like, you know, how to play the inside. Um, two of the ones that always stick out to me. And, and, and funny thing is, uh, one is an offensive move, one is a defensive move. Both involve the elbows. I remember the one time... And one trainer put me on the bag, and he goes, and I want you to throw a couple right hands, but miss the bag. I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, just watch. If you throw a right hand, but throw it slightly to the side. When I would do that, my elbow would hit the bag. You know, so it looks like you're throwing a right hand, and you're just missing it, quote unquote. But you're actually kind of using an elbow in there, and that was a very good move on the inside. You know, you know, another trick I learned was. Um, 
the first fight that I had um, it was my my first win. It was uh, I fought a kid from Westfield up in Massachusetts, and we fought um, in New York. Um, and actually, the guy he's since passed away. We had him as a guest on the show one time. I uh, put the show together. His name was Steve Acunto. And I'm fighting this guy. He was about 215 pounds. I was about 192. So he's much bigger than me, but not taller. And every time I'd hit him with a left hook, he'd clinch me. And I couldn't break I couldn't break free. He was just strong. Wasn't talented. Wasn't fast. You know, I could hit him at will, but he... I mean, there was nothing I could do. So I remember telling my trainer in Philly, I was like, you know, this guy, I said, I stopped him, but I could have really, I could have really knocked him out. But he kept holding me, kept clinching me. He goes, what'd you do when you clinched? I'm like, well, I tried to do this. I tried to punch, but he had my arms pinned. He goes, next time he does that, just bounce. To bounce. What are you talking about? He goes, watch. He goes, clinch me. And I did. And naturally, when you clinch somebody, the way your body's kind of mold. It's like your chin goes on the guy's shoulder, as this guy's chin was on my shoulder. He goes bounce. So even though I'm doing bounce, it's like I'm trying to break the clinch. I'm actually shouldering him in the mouth every single time. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that, 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 that is slick. That, it, 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 it's, it's, it's simple, but a lot of people don't think a little thing. Like that, and all those little yeah. things. It's like a master carpenter. It, it, it just, it just builds that solid foundation. And you never yeah. know when that'll come in handy. That is just class. It's easy to think of. No, it's not. Sometimes people don't. You got to think of that stuff. No. The other one they, I remember they taught me. My my trainer Kevin taught me one day, and you know, a lot of days we would just do body work. We would just work inside of the body, kind of like what they do now. I mean, we didn't do this technique where we put the tire in the ring and each put a foot in the tire. That way, you can't back off. But he would do a lot of times. We're just working body. We're working in close. We're working. And snug. I want you to learn how to get inside and then stay in there, and how to use angles, how to step off. Um, you know how to keep that guy turning. So, as we're working, the one thing he did was he's like, you know, keep keeping your elbows in tight because what you're going to want to do is when a guy is punching around the side, you can time it right. You just you don't stick it out too far because then you open your ribs up. He goes, but if you can time it right, you just tense your elbow just a little bit. And he shut it out. Maybe he just did that. He goes, he goes, he goes, you're actually going to bruise people by blocking punches. I said, really? And I remember, I know you guys have both have seen me. I'm short. I'm very thickly built. I have very thick arms, kind of like Rocky Marciano. Um, so what I would do, and I remember um, we're, I'm in there one day working with my trainer, Kevin, we're in there sparring. You know, we're doing a pretty good sparring session, a lot of body work in there. And um, we were in, in close, toe-to-toe, and he went to throw a right hand around the ribs. And just like he taught me, I jutted the elbow out, and my elbow caught him perfectly right in the center of his forearm. And you could see he step, took a step right back, Winston. He came in the next day. Now, Kevin, for being, you know, a black man, and was very light skinned. So light skinned. One time we were sparring, and a woman couldn't tell which one was me and which one was him. <laughs> my dad, my dad's again, and then you know, Tommy, and you both gentlemen have met my dad. You know, my dad, Italian guy, you know, yeah. Olive, yeah. and like me, and he's standing in the doorway watching us and the woman's in there and he's like, he's like oh yeah whatever he goes on that here my son yeah, he's training he's in the ring right now and she goes oh which one's your son because remember we both had headgear on um you know we're both wearing i think at the time um trash bags and i may have even had on um a tank top but we both had trash bags on so covering up a good bit of our tourists. and she's like which one's your son and my dad goes oh, he's the one in the, the black trunks and then we took our headgear off and you see a african-american gentleman and the woman stopped her jaw dropped. She said, my dad, she goes, well, you do got to admit the other guy does have very light legs. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Kevin came in the next day and we were sparring. He goes, he goes, you know, I, I teach you a lot of tricks in here. He goes, and I'm proud to see you utilizing them. But please don't do this to me again. And he pulls up his arm and his arm, if, to give you the best description, take the Baltimore River 
Ravens jersey, which is that deep purplish black. That's what his entire forearm looked like. Now, my dad, who likes to also study urban, that's what we did. My dad studies herbal medicine, and he always had he always had the arnica with him. He would actually get the berries. He wouldn't even buy it at the store. He would actually go to a um, a health store um, and get the actual berries, and he would boil them and strain them, and then he'd mix them with like a Vaseline intensive care, a wintergreen rubbing alcohol, and he would make almost was like a, um, an ointment out of it. And he put it on Kevin's forearm. And when Kevin came in a day later, that bruise was gone. Which I should be smart because me and my friend's one son, who's 23, got into a punch war. And he's got these bony little knuckles and he bruised my bicep up, but I still won. Someone said to him, like, Steve, why don't you get into a punch war with him? And he's always been, I love the kid, but he's always been, you know, one of the knuckleheads, even when he's there. And he's like, I thought I, he's like, I thought I could take him. And then they're like, Steve, remember what you put on Facebook like six years ago? Do you ever try to do a punch war with a guy that's trained box? And we were just doing jabs. And I was just jabbing him in the arm. And he's like, Jesus Christ, you're giving me a dead arm. So he hauled back with his bony ass right hand as hard as he could. I'm like, do it again. I'm like, all right, now you give me one. I hit him. I lifted him about six, six inches off the floor. <laughs> and he's like, oh, whatever, whatever. And then he's like, oh, I'm going to hit you again. He hits me again. I hit him with another right hand. And I'm like, you know what? Forget that. Get rid of that right hand. I said, I'm left hooking you. So he tensed up, and I hit him with a left hook. And, I mean, I almost knocked him over. He's like, oh, my God, I'm done. I'm done. No, I, I want one more. And he hits me again. I said, all right. And I cranked one. And I, when I say I cranked the left hook, I cranked the left hook. Unfortunately, I was a couple shots deep by this point, and my accuracy wasn't too too great. And I and he doesn't have the he doesn't have the big thick, thick arms like me. I kind of missed his arm and may have caught him in the ribs, <laughs> and I, I may have put him down <laughs> for a few minutes. Oops. Yeah, exactly. No. You know what? And, and I was telling him, you know, and he, when I did that boxing video a couple of years ago, um, he's in a little bit, but he was actually the film that he was staying with my friend and he brought him over and he, and I'm like, yeah, you're going to film this one. And he filmed it. He's in, like I said, a couple of the quick shots. Um, but I was showing him the one picture I have in my basement, which was a picture of um, Marciano and La Stars in their second fight. When Rocky just ran roughshod, won by just hitting anything he could, fist on flesh. You know? And that's, that's one of the mistakes made. The guys fight really good defensive fighters um, that are, you know, really good to land a good clean punch on. Your guys like your uh, Floyd Mayweathers, uh, your guys like your Parnell Whitakers. Um, you know, a lot of times what you need to do in those fights is not go for the head. Like a lot of guys would try to hit Floyd on the head. And he's he's just so quick and he's so subtle and he's, you know, just so good defensively with his eyes and seeing things and rolling and all that. Um, you have to put fist on flesh. You look at the guys that did the best against him. De La Hoya for eight rounds by using his jab to the torso. Um, Jose Luis Castillo by just being rough on the inside and punches and Marcus Maidana, same thing. You know, they were hitting anything they could.
Now, but I'm going to be an Instagram model, or I'm going to be a YouTube blogger. That's my career. You have to be, and you have to be a somewhat original. And here's the thing: you have to be entertaining. And I mean, we can all get up here and we can tell stories and tell j- jokes and all that. And you know what? We generally, all three of us, do laugh at each other. And, you know, and we enjoy our stories. But we're all on the same kind of, um, you know, minds that we're all in the same kind of field. We're in the boxing. We're in the combat sports. So when I tell like, a lot of these boxing anecdotes and, you know, and Tom will tell stories. Um, Rich will tell stuff, you know, from your time, especially like, um, when you're down at VMI, box at the Naval Academy and this and that. You know, we enjoy them kind of involved in the sport. I'll give you a perfect example of a guy is our, our good friend, John Tully. I follow John religiously on social media because the guy cracks me the hell up. I think he's entertaining as hell. You know, he's got great personality. But a lot of his, like, boxing stories, you know, if you're not a combat sports fan or a boxing fan, it's more like, okay, because you don't understand the intricacies of the sport. You don't understand all the background stuff. So he can tell a story and you may not, you know, get the full appreciation of it where guys like us do. Um, You know, I can sit there, I can tell stories right now. It's like, um, Perfect example. I like to always give my one friend a hard time. We grew up together. 
and I'll tell them one story, and it's like, I might get you guys to, to laugh. You guys may laugh, but when I tell it in front of our group of friends, our circle, because they know me, they know him, they know, know his wife, they know the whole background, they're on the floor. So if I made that into a video, I, I might get some people to like it, but I sure as hell couldn't make a career out of it. You know, I actually was going to try to do a stand-up bit on this one thing just to see how it would go over. I was going to video and everything. I never did. Um, but I'm just going to see, and I'm going to do, I'm going to say it just like I say it to them. And I'm going to say it just like I would do in the bit. And I just want to get your guys, I just want to see your natural reaction to it. Okay. We, we got my friend Mike here, you know, you know, we grew up together. Um, we'll, we'll go out some nights and, um, you know, we've been friends since 1983. We'll be hanging out. And one night I was getting around to free drinks. Cause it was my birthday, you know, and we're getting around to free drinks. He's like, yo, you can share one of them. I'm like, hell's to the no. And he, turned, and he turns to the girl that was the waitress with the tray of shots. He's like, can you believe this guy? And we've been friends for at least. And he looks at me. Cause this girl was only about like 22 years old. We were both around 38. And he goes, we've been friends since we were kids, like almost 10 years, you know? <laughs> so, um, he's getting, you know, he's getting married. So right before he gets married, me and him are out drinking one night, taking a walk. He's like, yo, he's like, you know, I'm getting married, right? I said, yo, no, I'm not. I'm in the wedding. Of course I know you're getting married. He's like, well, I just want you know, we're going to have a son. I said, are you, are you not telling me something? He goes, no, 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 no. She's not pregnant. I said, oh, okay. He goes, but we are going to have a son. I said, oh, okay. He goes, and he goes, and when we do, I want you to train him. I said, of course, it, it would be my honor. Now, this is back in 2012. We were both, he was 36. I was on the cusp of 36. And he's like, I want you to train him. I said, of course I will. He goes, oh, dude, he goes, we're going to start him early. He goes, that kid's not going to be able to walk, and he's going to put gloves on him. And we're going to start him, and we're going to teach him the ins and outs of it. We're going to teach him Philly style. I don't know where this wee shit is coming in. It's going to be me teaching him all this, right? But he goes, but I'll be the money man. I'll be the manager. And we're going to get this kid. He's going to be Olympic gold medalist. I'm like, oh, shit, he's got some pressure going on me. The kid's not even conceived yet. And he's going to be a world champion. I said, oh, Christ. He goes, he's going to make so much money, I'm going to retire when I'm 50 years old. I said, you're 36 already. I said, you know, I said, I'm, a, I'm a good trainer. I said, I'm good. I know the sport. But, I mean, getting them to be a 13-year-old world champion might be a little bit of a stretch. But, you know, when Dominic was born in 2017, when my friend Mike was 40, I said, Mike, I said, if we work with your plan here, we can get him in the 2024 Olympics at seven and a half years old. And then we've got to get him title fight in the second pro fight if we want to hit your uh, 50-year-old you know, goal here. He's like, um, yeah, you're funny. So now they're they're getting married. Mike, Mike, his fiance Natalie, now his wife, his cousin Johnny, who I also grew up with. We're all going down to the shore. It's the Fourth of July, and we're going to have a blast. We're going to go down there and just raise hell, raise holy hell. So we're in the car, and you know, I this is 2012. I had met Natalie about two and a half years prior when they first started going out. I like the girl. She's a great girl. She thinks I'm a nice person. She's not the smartest. So um, we're sitting there, and somehow the conversation broke to the Rocky movies. Oh, I love the Rocky movies, and Natalie is just so innocent and so nice. Because do you know Michael was in the last Rocky movie? That being Rocky Balboa, and you see his eye is get as big as saucers. I said, no, I didn't know that. She goes, oh my god, he never told you. I said, no, he didn't. She goes, dude, he went down to the audition. There was like 2,000 people there, but they asked him to read for a part, and, you know, he got to read for the part of a thug in a bar, and he didn't get it, but he got, but he got to be on set two days, and he, yeah, and he got a picture of, uh, like, he said he got a picture of Sylvester Stallone, and he got he was on set two days, but he got cut out of the, the movie. I said, Nat, let me ask you a question. Did he have his appendix out three days before the um, audition? She's like, no, why? I said, because that's my story. 
<laughs> he turned beet, he turned beet red. She looked at him, Michael. You told me his story. He goes, I also told you I was in, in um greatest for prison too. <laughs> <laughs> So the next time they came over, I showed her the article on the wall where I got interviewed in the paper. I'm like, yeah, that's my name, not his. <laughs> like, I think I could do that bit. Like, I could, I could never make a crack. One, you don't know my friend. So I'm making fun of somebody you don't know. And and I tell I look good, and I do. And you guys can't see me right now, but I get the good facial expressions going, and I get the sarcastic looks on my face. I try to pattern my, a lot of my stuff, and I don't know if you follow this guy. You guys ever follow Adam Calhoun? Uh, no, never heard of him. Go on YouTube right now uh, and look up Adam Calhoun. C A L H O U N. He's um, he's a military guy. His son's in the Marines. Um, you know, big red beard. Covered in tattoos, but he's really sarcastic, and he just rips people to shreds. And like he'll make fun of people. Like he makes fun of um, you know, um, people that protest things. He's like, these Antifa guys. And he's like, you see like a video of like this young seventeen year old kid with like you know a, a hood on his head, and he's like, we need to resist. And then you see Adam Calhoun with like a pair of underwear on his head. He goes, resist, brothers. And then he's like, what you need to do is take these kids, give them a smack in the mouth. And he's like just ripping these guys to shreds, but he's funny, you know. You know, you, but that's somebody's like, you know. I try to pattern after, but it's tough. Well, yeah, yeah, you know, maybe Tony just work up a little five minute gig, go to a local comedy club. You got nothing to lose, you know. Because it has a lot, a lot in common with boxing. Why do they call it the punchline? You're trying to get an involuntary reaction from your audience, right? Boxing, you're trying to knock your opponent out. And and both really both look easy, but both are hard, very hard. We know well, we know that. And and both really, when you think about it, you can't fake either one. I mean, in a fight you either win or get your ass kicked. And on the stage people either laugh or they don't. Right. So uh and, and there's there's pauses, there's rhythm, there's timing, there's the the bright lights. I mean there's a lot of similarities there. I mean I've done some some, some amateur night stuff and it you know it looked easy well like yeah. I thought boxing would look easy <laughs> yeah. yeah okay show us killer you know and uh, but you got nothing to lose and if you had the balls to, to get in the ring well hey it can carry over because both activities are, are not rooted in polite society okay yeah. good way to word it and both are solitary acts that require a lot of bravery so there you go I want to get you and pump it up there, bud. Because I do video editing, you know, for a hobby as well. And I like to do, you know, just things like for the hell of it. Are you guys familiar with the movie A Bronx Tale? Uh, I ne- I've never seen it. I've heard it, but I've never seen it. Uh, it's one of my favorites, Tom. And if you ever get a chance, uh, check it out. It's, it's a good movie. And to make it even better, the real behind-the-scenes story is even better because the, the main character that's, um, you know, the 17-year-old kid, who's first in the movie, he's nine, and then they show him later at 17. Um, but he's born between the local, like, neighborhood gangster, who's real smooth and real cool and always flash money and really sharp dressed, and then his father in the movie played by Robert De Niro, um, and he was just a... Honest, hardworking man, bus driver, you know, high integrity, and all that. So he kind of caught between what his father wants and then just through this cool lifestyle of the gangster. But the real story is that the guy that is Ed, um, he took it to um, Broadway, you know, and Chaz Palminteri, who played the gangster in real life, was the kid. The uh, Collagero, and they call him C in the movie. So he was doing, and he was just telling his story. He was telling in a very entertaining way on Broadway. They told Robert De Niro, Robert, you got to go see this. This is really amazing. And since De Niro did, like, you know, a lot of these, you know, gangster movies with, you know, the, um, um, like, Goodfellas and um, The Godfather and all that. 
and goes to see it. He falls in love with the story. He goes, I got to turn this into a movie. So he approaches Chad Palminteri. Chad Palminteri says, yeah, we'll turn this into a movie under the condition I play the gangster, Sonny. And they, they agree to it. So now the movie comes out 27 years ago. It's a major success. Um, but Chaz Palminteri still does this one-man adaption of it. I've seen it two times. And it's amazing because you're looking at a 65-year-old man's face, but you're still seeing a nine-year-old kid in there. And he does the whole – he does everybody. He, he does lines from everybody. He really does it good. Well, there's one scene, if you go back in the movie, even if you YouTube it, it's the craft scene early in the movie. Um, there was, obviously, you have your gangster, Sonny. You have the little nine-year-old kid, Caladro. And then you have a couple of the guys that are playing craft. And the three guys that he really focuses on is this one guy, they call him Eddie Mush. Eddie Mush is the notorious gambler of the group, you know, bet on anything, but he always loses. That's why they call him Mush. Everything he touches turns to Mush. We have this other guy, Joe the Whale, who's like 450 pounds. He's obviously huge. And then you have another guy, they call him Frankie Coffee Cake, because his face looks like a Drake coffee cake full of acne and all that. He's real ugly. So now they're playing the craft game, and somebody's letting this little kid throw the dice for him. And you know, first of all, Eddie Mush goes, hey, I want to bet on four, which was Sonny betting on. He's like, I don't want no, 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 I don't want you one four. You're bad luck. And he throws him out of the room, and he puts him in the bathroom. He says, Eddie, you go sit in the bathroom. And then this fat guy, Jojo the Whale, is leaning on him. He said, Jojo, stop leaning on me. Well, come on, I'm going to put a bed in. He's like, you get the fuck off me. Stop leaning on me, you fat fuck. You don't put him in the bathroom, too. He gives these two guys crammed in the bathroom. Now, the little kid's about to roll, and you see the real ugly guy. He goes, whoa, 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 whoa. I don't want this kid looking at that face when he's rolling up my dice. Put him in the bathroom as well. So I'm talking to Mike and his wife, because his wife loves the movie. I'm talking to them both. And I'm like, you know what would be hilarious? If we improv that scene. I said, Mike, every time you bet on something, you are bad fucking luck. You are Mikey Mush. You have two, you have two cousins that are both my age. Johnny, a big guy. He's not Jojo the whale. He's John John the whale. And Joey, I love the kid, but he's ugly. He's fucking ugly. We got Joey Coffee. And I was like, you know what? Dominic might be too young to actually do, like, because he's just he's a little boy, but maybe get another, maybe kid like seven years old. And we are actually going to film that scene. And I'm going over all the lines. Go, whoa, 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 whoa. Frankie Coffee Cake, no good. I don't want this kid looking at that face when he's rolling my dad. So I'm like, Tell me, you're, you're like a natural. You're good. Mike's like, oh my God, I, I'd have to study lines. I'm like, Mike, you say one line. I want to bet. I want to bet on Tony. No, I don't want you to bet on me. The money no good? That's all you got to say. He said, but I get nervous. Like, <laughs> um, I'll, send you, I'll send you guys that clip. I, when you see it, you guys are like, this is great. Um, it really is a, a fantastic movie. Hey, guys, at uh, 10 o'clock right now, we got uh, Tyson Fury and the behind-the-scenes of the Schwartz fight. This ought to be pretty interesting. ESPN, check, check it out. Yeah, it's coming on right now, so I am out. Check the fights this weekend, guys. We'll do it. You guys? Oh, okay, I'm sorry. No shit. Yeah, I didn't want it. Huh. Well, he, he could claim you robbed and he, he's really true <laughs> yeah. you know where I stole that line from um, back in the day and they showed this fight in the um, in the movie when they made um, Bleed for this uh, about Vinny Paz um, when he fought 
Gilbert Delay back in 91, right before he broke his neck. The fight in Providence, he knocks Delay out, wins the title. Well, technically, you have the belt, but you don't keep that belt. Like, you give it back to the champion, and they custom order you your own belt. But, I mean, Vinny and his entourage had it, because I guess they were doing some photos and stuff, whatever. So, and they all go to a nightclub with the belt, and someone took it. So, he goes, poor delay. He gets his ass kicked, gets knocked out, and still could claim he was robbed.
Like I tend to forget he had that one loss. Okay, well, sounds good. I my my death wish kicked in late. I had one of those days where I had um the worst anxiety, so it was kind of tonight. This was good. This I needed. alternative. 